from lovely Maple Grove, Minnesota and SixFootMama.com. This is Still Growing with Jennifer Ebling. Still Growing is a gardening podcast dedicated to helping you and your garden grow. Hi there, everyone, and welcome to Still Growing, and thank you for listening. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling. Well, August is here. It's officially hot. It is the time of year that I also like to think about as a second spring, which is kind of a great way to deal with the heat. And of course, I think about it that way because it's time to start planting our cold weather crops. And I will begin planting things like lettuce and Swiss chard and spinach on the north side of my house and then slowly move those containers back to the southern garden as things begin to cool off in the fall. It is such a fun time of year because it's a chance to kind of revisit some of the edibles that were successes in the spring. And one of my standouts this year is something that I ordered from Renee's Garden, uh, the seed company. And I did not anticipate that it was going to be the superstar for me that it was. And I completely fell head over heels in love with this particular plant. And I'm talking about her red deer tongue lettuce. Now, as the name implies, this is a lettuce that has very dark, deep purple leaves. It is absolutely gorgeous. It reminds me of a very deep Merlot color. Or if you think about the cranberry relish that your grandma probably passes around at Thanksgiving time, that's kind of the color of the leaves of this particular red lettuce. And the reason I loved it so much is, number one, the color was amazing, and it dressed up any salad that we had. But the other thing is, it is so soft. The leaves are soft. The flavor is very gentle. And of course, that always goes over well when you're feeding kids. And of course, I've got four, and I want them to eat salad. So uh, having that red deer tongue lettuce go over so well and seeing the kids so excited to pick it when it was time to make a salad for supper. That was just a complete win for me. But the other thing that I will forever think about when I think of this red deer tongue lettuce is the fact that this lettuce taught me or reminded me that lettuce is part of the Asteraceae family. And I bring this up because recently I interviewed Deborah Madison, the author of the fabulous cookbook, Vegetable Literacy. It is one of my all-time favorites. And we were talking about the sunflower family or the Asteraceae family. And Deborah likes to refer to it as some rough stuff from outdoors. Uh, Her dad referred to this particular family this way. Her dad was a horticulturist. And, you know, the things that are in this family are the classic sunflower-shaped flowers, things like echinacea or daisies, uh, milk thistles, if you think about the flower on those, uh, marigolds and artichokes and calendulas, things of that nature. So that makes complete sense. And the leaves on these plants are kind of rough. They're kind of rough, tough, sandpapery type uh, textures. And then they have these adorable, adorable little flowers on top. You know, they're the kind of flowers that when you ask a little girl to, to draw you a picture of a flower... Uh, they almost always end up drawing something from the the daisy family. Well, I'll be darned if this red deer tongue lettuce didn't produce the sweetest, littlest yellow flower when it bolted about two weeks ago. And it completely charmed me because, of course, these little yellow flowers are popping out of the top of this vibrant red deer tongue lettuce that's that's bolted and they're about, you know, three feet in the air right now. And I immediately recognized that flower and it clicked in my brain. Yes, this is part of the Asteraceae family. So I will forever connect the two. And I had to chuckle because um, it was something when I was interviewing at Deborah at the time, I could not get it through my head. And then here I had this experience, not just a few weeks later, and all of a sudden it became completely clear. So 
I love it when the garden reinforces something new that we've learned so that we can become better gardeners. You know, something else that I wanted to share with you along the lines of cooking is a recipe that I had learned about after interviewing another fantastic cookbook author, and her name is Anna Thomas. And she's the author of the fabulous new cookbook, Vegan Vegetarian Omnivore. So she'll be in an upcoming show as well. This was a true pleasure for me because I had never spoken with Anna before, and she is a gem. But one of the things that she had featured in her cookbook is a carrot top pesto. And I think this pesto alone is a reason to buy her cookbook. But I wanted to share it with you because we made it. We actually uh, made this carrot top pesto. So the boys and Emma and I love to make just a regular basil pesto. They're completely trained and certified. They know what they're doing. And when I saw that she was featuring this carrot top pesto, I was so excited because I knew that the kids would be enamored with it. And basically, you take those things that you normally throw away, the part of the carrot that you normally don't use, those bushy greens, and you use them in the pesto. Pesto, and you take some trimmed carrot tops and some garlic and walnut, and then of course incorporate some basil leaves along with a few other ingredients like mint and olive oil and salt and lemon juice, kind of the usual suspects, and you make this pesto. And it was a complete hit because it's peppery and it's light and it's something different. And I love that I am teaching my kids that there are things that they can do with the garden harvest that are exceptionally creative and equally yummy, just as yummy as some of the standard recipes that they've come to expect. You know, I actually find that when we get really creative with the garden and the garden harvest, that's what gets their attention and that's what they remember most. So give something like that a try and certainly check out this cookbook. It's absolutely glorious. It's beautiful. I love the cover. Um, I'm sure you can get it on Amazon. It's Vegan Vegetarian Omnivore, and that will be in an upcoming show probably in about four or five weeks. So stay tuned for that. Well, today's show gives me the perfect excuse to tell you about the lattice that I have on the side of my house, on the eastern side of my house. And I had this lattice installed about four or five years ago. And when I put it in, I knew that it was going to fill up a very large space because I wanted it there because the side of the house was boring and it was ugly. It was nothing but vinyl siding. And without any windows in this area, it really was just not a great backdrop to my eastern garden. So I have this huge lattice that I designed. It's probably 14 feet high by 14 feet wide. And in the middle of it is a sun fountain. So it's a a sun that I bought on a garage sale and then I drilled into the mouth of the sun. And then I have tubing that goes up behind the lattice and the water comes out of the sun's mouth and then it goes into a rain barrel where I have some water plants growing. So it's all just this gorgeous little part of the garden. And I knew that I wanted to have a vine growing up this lattice. And I considered a lot of traditional options, including uh, a climbing hydrangea, which I had grown at my old house where my parents now live. And it's glorious. I mean, after all this time, that climbing hydrangea is one of my favorites. But the only drawback to a climbing hydrangea is that it's so slow growing. So instead of doing that, I had read an article where a local gardener had used hops. And I decided to give it a try. And I found this golden hops, uh, this golden hop vine at a local nursery. And I completely fell in love with it because it has the most spectacular golden yellow maple-like leaves. And they usually transform color in the fall. And of course, the hops are flowering. It is just spectacular. And the color is so different. Now, these hops vines, I cut all the way back every fall. And wouldn't you know, they grow up every spring stronger than ever. And they shoot up 14, 15, 20 feet into the air. They are a perfect fit for that lattice. And hops were equally enchanting to today's guest, Eric Sandrud of Mighty Axe Hops. 
Pops, and I'm thrilled that you get a chance to listen to him. Keep in mind that as we're having this interview, he is in his brand new hop yard placing poles on 40 acres of land this year and then 40 acres of land next year in addition to their processing facility. And when all of this work is done, Mighty Axe will be Minnesota's largest hop farm and harvest facility. Well, Eric, it's always a pleasure to interview a fellow Golden Gopher alumni, and you're also one of the University of Minnesota's most fearless entrepreneurs as you're blazing the way as an early grower and now processor of hops for the state of Minnesota. And I love thoroughly researching my guests, but I have to say that I searched and searched online, and I could not find out why you picked the name Mighty Axe Hops. So how did that become the name of your hops business? Well, back when we first started, I was really into the adjective mighty, and uh, we were looking for something that would both be like a farm name, uh, but also appeal to our urban Sun City Brewer uh, consumers, and uh, we didn't want like Singing Hills, uh, Rolling Sunny Acres as our name, because we felt like that's kind of an overused farm name, yeah. and then Mighty Axe is where we landed, and uh, we like it for the fact that it's kind of like Paul Bunyan's Axe and Mighty Mississippi, which are a really important aspect of our kind of Minnesotaness. Absolutely. And then I saw on your Facebook page, you had a, you must have had some type of competition with students from the University of Minnesota because um, they came up with some uh, concepts for a tap handle and your tap handle is awesome because it looks like an axe. Yeah, he, he did a really good job. His name was Jordan, the student who designed that, and uh, we actually commissioned him to, be, to make a handful more. So they're all handmade, and those are uh, what brewers can use if they choose uh, to highlight that they're using Mighty Axe hops in their beer. So when a beer is on tap with our hops in it, they throw the tap handle on, and the uh, drinker knows that it's got local hops. I love that. And in terms of leadership, um, you and is it Ben Boo? You guys have yep. been together. He's your chief horticulturist. He's now going to be your chief operating officer. Tell us a little bit about how you met and how do you work together so well? Well, we met in, in college through mutual friends, and uh, we went. We ended up going to this Students in Sustainable Agriculture Conference over in Wisconsin together. And on the way home, we were like, he was looking for something to do with his horticulture degree, and I was looking for something to farm. And uh, we wrote up the first business plan that ended up being Mighty Axe Hops. So that was about four years ago. Um, and it's been great working with someone who, you know, we were friends first. And uh, now we spend a whole lot of time together. Uh, and uh, it's, plenty of, it's plenty of fun. Wow. Keep ourselves entertained. Well, it's great that you guys get along so well. So that's awesome. You've said in almost every interview that I've read about you that it was obvious to you that there was a market for hops and that people want craft breweries and they want local hops. In fact, uh, just today in the Star Tribune, there's an article about one of the first local craft breweries in Minnesota that was started 30 years ago, and it's all about Summit Brewery. So if you haven't read it, yeah. you got to go check that out. But I wanted to go back to... Uh, uh, June of 2013. That was just three years ago. You had just launched Mighty Axe Hops, and I was reading on your Facebook page, which is such a great uh, written history in a sense of you know what yeah. you've gone through. I just thought it was oh, tremendous. Remember too. Oh my goodness! I mean, if you can't use that material for a book at some point, I just I mean that would be a huge loss. I, your, <laughs> your writing's fantastic, and then the whole story—it's just evolving right there. I love it, but. Um, you at in that first at that period of time you had grown 25 hops plants and that <laughs> had successfully yielded 7 ounces of hops which you donated right. to Fair State Brewery and then they brewed that into 6 barrels of India Pale Ale and i'm reading this and i'm going okay all right that's a lot of work and not a ton of not a ton of you know end product here but then you read this extraordinary part that your very first batch of beer that was made with your hops sold out out in just four hours, and you wrote, it was a complete zoo, there was a line out the door, and I'm going, what is the big deal with locally grown hops? Why is there such a rabid response, do you think? 
Well, I think it, it, it just kind of shows like this is just an extension of the local passion that moved and is still moving through and with restaurants. I mean, you can't go to a restaurant these days that a recently opened restaurant that doesn't talk about some amount of local sourcing or some sustainability in sourcing or responsibility in sourcing. Um, we see the same same focus on transparency and authenticity in our food all the way up through to the largest you know food producers and uh, providers uh, in the state. So I think it's just it's just tapping into that that farmers market fire that people have, and uh, it's a, you know local support and craft is something that people who like craft beer tend to also really like. And we're just letting them express that passion with the ingredients in their beer, uh, not just where the beer was brewed, but where the ingredients in the beer were grown. Well, and the other thing, too, that I have to say, Eric, is it's all about the relationships. And one thing yeah, that I absolutely. think is not stressed enough is that you are like an ambassador extraordinaire for Mighty Axe Hops because you could just be off growing this and not really saying a ton about it. You could be quietly doing it, which a lot of people do. There are small oh, yeah. uh, people that are doing it. But you have just taken this mantle and the microphone and just gone completely crazy with it. You're everywhere when it comes to talking about cops growing in the state of Minnesota. I mean, it comes naturally for us. I mean, this is what we love to do. And just recently, you know, we got that opportunity to do do it full time, do it for real. And uh, there's nothing we'd rather be doing. And I like talking about things that I like. Yeah. Well, don't we all? But I mean, how fantastic you found it before the age of 30. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, pretty lucky. Yeah, you're very lucky. Pretty lucky. Well, I want to set the stage a little bit with some economics and some geographic considerations that I think impacts hop growers. You know this very well, and microbrewers. But for people who maybe are not familiar with this whole arena, I want to set the stage a little bit. On the economic side, just this past spring, there have been news stories that are warning that the craft beer industry is going to be facing a hop shortage. And the hot, dry weather last summer blighted the European hop harvest, which had a big impact on the demand for hops with the craft beers. And then from a geography standpoint, I think in the United States, you've got this interesting cross-country thing going on because the state with the highest concentration of microbreweries is Vermont. And on the other end of the United States, on the West Coast, Washington is the biggest producer. 79% of the country's hops comes from the state of Washington. And the demand for aroma hops, which is the type of hops that Mighty Axe is growing, means that breweries sometimes are going to have to end up rationing their batches. Today, craft breweries make up a little over 10% of the beer market, but that percentage is on the rise. So the demand for hops is just continuing to grow, and it's a tremendous time to get into hops farm. Me. What would you tell someone who asks you if they should start growing hops? Well, I would say that while there is certainly uh, a whole lot of demand, uh, both from the consumer side and from the brewer side, for a whole lot of different reasons, it's not a guaranteed thing. Um, the demand is there, but only if you're providing high quality, produced well, uh, no compromise hops. So brewers and drinkers. Uh, really want local, and they really want that local to be just as good, if not better, than what they're getting already. And that's a really important caveat for people to consider. Because in order to produce quality hops in the field and then process them into the pellets that brewers use, um, both of those things take a lot of talent and a lot of capital. So that's a, that's a, that's the big but. A lot of demand, but it has to be really good. And it has to have the quality that, you know, probably an initial investment would require, right? Yeah, that's what that's what we're learning. I mean, you can move a small amount of hops that is like, you know, kind of a weekend job that will never pay you that much money um, as like a hobby. You can probably do that on the weekends. But if you're looking to do it anything close to part or full time, it's a significant investment. 
Wow. Well, um, here's something else that I thought was very interesting. Back when you were getting started, you met with a handful of growers in their area. You visited Hop Farms and you researched online sources like the Vermont Extension Program. And I'm curious about which of those early steps, those early visits or or experiences really stands out to you as something that was super inspiring to you in terms of getting started. Oh, uh, I think, I mean, we got to go back to the, the, the original hop growers here in the state. They were, they were called hippity hops. They're kind of the first hop farm to really um, make a mark in people's minds. And we spent, uh, I think it was at least one year out there helping them pick by hand. And we got to see what at that point was the most um, organized, mature uh, hop farm in the state and see it hands on. Uh, and that was something that I think was really impressive for Ben and I to see, wow, you know, they had a quarter acre of hops and just to see how many hops a quarter acre was. Cause at that point we had the 25 plants and we were just thinking about growing to the quarter acre scale. Um, and they were really uh, inspiring for us just to go out there and get our hands on with them. So that'd be the most inspiring. Tell, um, tell, tell, uh, people who, who are listening, what it's like to see a hop yard for the first time, because honestly, I don't know what it looks like. And then I'm looking at it and I'm like, oh, my God, these things are going straight up in the air. I had no idea. And then it looks like telephone poles every, what, 10, 12 feet? I have no idea. Yeah, 30 feet or so. It's, uh, um, it's, it's kind of a wild experience. It looks like a vineyard, except for, you know, 12 feet taller than a vineyard. <laughs> and this enormous green curtains or sales of uh, hop plants. Um, it's really a sight to see. Even our acre and a half down in Ham Lake that's mature, and it's on the trellis. It looks incredible right now, and it fills another month of growing. So when we get the, get the full 80 going out here in Foley, that is going to be uh, quite the sight. It'll be like when the windmills started popping up all over the landscape, and people thought that was yeah. extraordinary. Yeah. Wow. Now, uh, here's something else I was thinking about this morning is, have you ever flown a drone over your hop yard? Uh, we have not, uh, but we will. You will. Um, we're waiting to uh, probably about 2018. Okay. Once uh, the acreage out here in Foley is, is more mature. There's a nice roll to the field here in Foley, and it's just going to make an incredible video. Wow. Oh, absolutely. Oh, I want to see that. So I, I liked your <laughs> Facebook page, and I'm staying on, on uh, staying active on that thing. And I also want to encourage people listening to do that because, first of all, you're a great poster on your Facebook. You post really interesting well, things. Best place and, to find things about us, too. Yeah, and you're so clever, too, in your posting. So I thought it was <laughs> tremendous. So I think people will enjoy it. There's a, there's a high entertainment factor to your Facebook page, I think. I hope so. Um, the other thing is you have a Minnesota hops growers guide. Yes. Yeah. That's, we, we get so many questions and emails, uh, about growing hops, uh, here in Minnesota. And so we wanted to create something that would be kind of a close to one-stop shop and from the point of view of the grower. So we had been looking around and finding all these generally university produced, uh, guides about growing hops. And while they were great, they weren't from the, you know, the practical perspective. Yep. And so we have a grower's guide. We made it available for free because we want to see more people growing hops in Minnesota. This winter, we'll be updating it to kind of a 2.0 version and uh, with all the new lessons we've got, we've got. Wow. I absolutely love it. And I think it's so fantastic you offer it for free on your website. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's uh, I don't know how, how else we would do it. You know, it's not, um, not the, yeah, no, we, like, we like providing it for free. Like how much energy it gets people. Yep, so. it's, a, it's a great give back. Well, um, I wanted to have you give us a little hops 101 before we start talking too specifically about your hops operation, because there are a lot of terms that are unique to yeah. growing hops, and there are there's a lot of equipment that's needed to install a hop yard. There's poles and wires and anchors, and all kinds of things entwined. So I wanted to just throw the terms out there and then have you tell uh -huh. us what they mean. 
And (laughs) one of the first terms is this term bind or bind. And actually, when I read it, I thought the article had a typo. I'm like, oh, they typed a B instead of a V. They're not, they don't mean to type vine. They call them binds. What's the bind? Yeah, bind with a B. That's that's the horticultural term for the part of the plant that crawls up the string that, you know, everyone on the street, we'd all call it a vine, but it's technically a bind. And that is because of how it acts when it climbs. And how does it differently act? Than a vine. Yeah, what would you characterize uh, it climbs, it, as? it climbs in a clockwise motion uh, directly towards the sun, or I guess um, against gravity. That's a, a unique characteristic that gives it a new, uh, special name. And in how about culture? How about trellis installing? Yeah, trellis. The the trellis installation is a real. Uh, there's a lot of unique aspects to it. I mean, that's what we're doing right now as we speak. You got to drill the holes. You gotta put the poles in the hole. You gotta secure the poles into the hole by tamping, and then you gotta run all your cabling. So it's quite a bit of work. Uh, it is something that, if you have the capital to uh, mechanize parts of it, you can really speed it up. So out here, we're when we're installing this first forty this spring, we're going many hundreds of times faster than when we were installing just the quarter acre, even because wow. we're able to have the correct equipment to. Yeah. To make it uh, make it go go quick. Wow! Once again, right? Dad's always right. Have the right tools for the right job. <laughs> yeah. Yep. <laughs> well, what's cable rigging? Well, I mean, what and what are these different cables? So, is it is it? Do you call it the mm. the core line or choir line? So yeah, choir twine is actually the string that the plants grow up. It's like the it's like the growing media. But the the other cabling is there's two. There's a cable and there's wire. So there's a big, thick aircraft cable that you run across the top of the poles, and that's kind of the thing that holds the tension. And then you have wire, which in our case now will start to be uh, some dulled barbed wire. Uh, And that's what what you tie the coir twine to. So you have cable supporting wire, which the twine is tied off on, which is then what the hops crawl up. So you got three different kind of cable-like thing. So across the top, going from pole to pole, kind of like a clothesline, what kind of cable is that? That's an aircraft cable, so woven steel cable. Um, we're using five, uh, 5 sixteenths out here. Otherwise, we used a uh, quarter inch before okay. uh, down at the hand leg site. Okay. And then the, the stuff that runs up and down, is it just twine or is there something else with it? No, nope, just coir twine. Just, just so that, twine. Coir twine is made out of uh, coconut. It's a waste product from the coconut industry. Oh. And the reason that hop farms use it, every hop farm from smallest to largest uses that, especially in America, is because it's strong and it's rot resistant. Um, so it won't deteriorate. Uh, as your plants get stronger and more mature, they'll get heavier and heavier. And you need a string that can last the whole season okay. to su- support that weight. And then along the bottom, you've got, uh, you have some type of cable, but you also have drip, right? Yeah, so hops need to be irrigated, at least in a production setting, in order to kind of commercial yields. So um, you need to run a drip system. So very efficient irrigation, which is excellent. Okay. Um, But you run a drip system and you should just let that run on the ground. It's going to roll it out on the ground and let it sit there. The the lower cable down there was a mistake. That's something oh. that we'll be updating. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. That just gets in the way. You don't need to do that. Oh, you don't? <laughs> yeah. Oh, interesting. See, there's another iteration that's gone by the wayside. Yep. Well, yep. now let's talk construction a little bit about the, and, and I want to talk specifically about the poles. I just mm-hmm. about died laughing when I saw on this YouTube video that you posted back in April of 2014, there's five of you. You look like basically young, skinny kids, guys and gals, <laughs> and you have basically lassoed this ginormous pole. You had these poles delivered to your property. You said they're yep. $300 a piece, and then it's like you're roping and wrangling them and you're all heaving them out of the truck and this thing falls on the ground and makes this huge divot in the dirt and I'm watching, I mean, this took all your strength collectively together. How on earth did you do that? Well, that's a, that's a great example of things that you stop doing when you can afford the, the right <laughs> equipment. So uh, those poles, I should say, those poles are like 70 bucks, I think. Wow. Um, they are 300 pounds. Yeah, I couldn't uh, So those it. are big tamarack poles. Those are way bigger than you actually need. But we weren't sure of that first year. 
So uh, now we're on to, to pine, and pine is a lot lighter. So now our poles are only about 200, and uh, we have the right, we have, you know, bobcats with pallet forks on them, and this bobcat with a special um, claw, it's called the brute post grabber, hmm. that can just pick up a pole like it's a stick and orient it however you want to go right into the hole. It's amazing. Wow. And you don't have to put any type of cement or anything in there to secure that post. You just, you're digging them down deep enough and, and tamping it down that they're secure that way. Yeah, four feet in the ground uh, up here in the north, and uh, then we tamp them in, which is whatever noise you hear behind me. That's what we're doing right now. And um, for the for the kind of the interior poles, that's all you got to do. And then the outside for your anchors, uh, you want to put those into cement because that's really where all your tension is held. And the poles on the interior are just holding plants up, whereas all the tension of holding the lines is going into your your anchors or your deadman. Okay, so are those the pole the poles that are on the end that are kind of going? Uh, well, what are they? They're kind of like uh, I don't know, catty corner poles, right? They're kind of anchoring down. Is that what they're doing? Yep. Then? Yeah, yeah, the anchors there. So that's what the anchors do. They are holding the tension on. Uh, when the hops are not growing, when it's when it's winter time, uh, they mm-hmm. kind of. Uh, I don't know. To me, I look at all those poles and then the the anchor poles, and it kind of re- really echoes like being on a ship, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, there's a lot of uh, uh, different things you can see out here in the poles, and they're really just an incredible uh, landscape sight to behold. Yes, they when you are. have just acres and acres of straight poles and straight lines. It's really fantastic to look at. Yeah, it's it's just amazing. I, people who have never seen it have got to get on your Facebook page and, and see what you're posting. You know, um, I thought May 10th, 2014, you had a particularly poignant entry. You said, rain can be so cruel, so this is how far we'll go to never have to dig these holes again. And you had dug all these holes for the posts that you were going to put in the ground, and we were going to have rain, and you had gone to each hole and covered them with boxes trying to protect <laughs> protect the hole i am i'm sitting there watching this going wow it's it's kind of like a field of dream story right you're, you're going through all these mother nature challenges just trying to get started in this operation yeah well and the bad news is is that the uh those um turns out when it rains in a storm there's a lot of wind so that blew away the boxes and we ended up redigging not entirely, but redigging another foot out of each of those holes. Wow. So I'm, I'm wondering, have you ever had a uh, kind of a hops farming dream where you're you're so in it, right? Because you're doing it all the time. Do you ever have a dream where you're like, oh, my God, all the vines blew down and, you know, we had to start well, over? <laughs> I mean, at this point, at this point, this is my fifth season farming, which really isn't that much. But I've learned uh, a couple of things, and one of them is that, you know, it is how it is. Um, I had hail damage on my first my first year farming with vegetables, and that taught me a good lesson of you can worry about it, but that doesn't change anything. Yes. So there's a good kind of zen or wisdom out of farming that I'm trying to cultivate. So I try not to be as worried about that. Do what you can to prevent it, and, and that's, what's it. that's yeah. what happens. Yep. Yep. You're, you're a partner with Mother Nature. You're going to go where she leads you sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, April 1st of this year, uh, you had uh, an extreme honor, I thought, which was giving a TEDx talk. And you started out oh, by, yeah. by telling the story that you were kind of alluding to just now. And I thought the way you did it was very moving because you opened up your speech by asking people to imagine they're driving up to your farm with you. And you said the date was June 20th, 2012. It's burned into your brain. You were just 63 yep. days into farming. Uh, yeah. share, share what you saw and why you didn't give up, why you did not join the thousands of farmers that leave farming every single year. God, well, what I saw was all those 63 days of harder work than I ever imagined just destroyed. Um, we had had a hailstorm, and so it was just a lot of ice pellets and stalks of what used to be vegetables. And in the moment, I was pretty... Uh, heartbroken, as you might imagine. And I just kind of sat down and there was just a moment where you just had to decide, like, do I quit right now or do I not quit right now? And, 
that's probably the proudest decision of my life so far, deciding not to quit. If you had, if you had asked me before that, before sitting there in the middle of the field with all the hail, if I would have said, if I would have quit or kept going at a moment like that, I probably would have said I would have quit. Hmm. Um, but something uh, deeper in me and stronger than what I even expected out of myself kind of came out at that point. And that was when I knew, like, oh, well, I guess I'm going to be a farmer now forever. Because that was kind of like when you, when you commit after something like that, um, you're in it. You're in it now. It was a defining moment for you. Mm-hmm. One of my, one of my mentors says, uh, has this saying that uh, there's dirt in your blood hmm. when you're attached to farming. You can't get away with it. And so she interprets that moment as when all the farming history in my family came, came and made its presence felt and that the soil in my blood <laughs> was awoken. Your, so Your farming was really... DNA was activated. Yeah. Yep. Wow. Exactly. Well, your early pictures on Facebook that do go back to about 2013. And when I was looking at them, I'm trying to study about I was trying to study up on how you started and how you organized your hop yard. And I was going to ask you, it looked like uh, the vines at that time were kind of growing almost like a circus circus tent because they weren't growing straight up or were they? And I just saw a different angle or something. <laughs> no, that was the first 25. We were. Ben and I were college students still, and we were trying to figure out how to how to do it for as cheaply as possible. Um, we didn't have any money, so it was easier to get really short poles from like Menards, uh, and then have the plants crawl vertically or uh, horizontally, than have the plants grow 18 feet vertically. Okay. Um, so our uh, that does not work, by the way. Um, while it was only like five hundred dollars for all that stuff. Um, and that works for our pocketbooks. Plants don't like that. They, well, they perform really like poorly. Why? Why do they you know, perform uh, poorly? They like want to go straight up, so they would, they would, they would spin straight up and then fall down because they don't have any support. Oh. Um, huh. So, yeah, they want that ninety degree straight up from the ground. Um, wow! Isn't that fascinating? So, You'd think the ninety degree yeah, would be harder, wild. you know? Right. Right. That's just what they want to do. Well, there you go. You and your hops, you're getting to know each other. Yeah. And you totally. and you named one of them Matilda, apparently. <laughs> There's all sorts of funny names flying around out here. I, I bet there is. Well, you can get a little goofy, right? You're out there with hops all day Absolutely. long. Absolutely. Well, now the yep. plants themselves, I'm curious, are they expensive? Um, well, I mean, I don't know. What Define expensive. So we, we highly recommend people buy rooted cuttings or uh, what would also be called field-grade plants. Okay. From uh, Gorse Valley hops, they're a propagator in Michigan. So rooted cuttings have a much higher chance of successfully growing than a rhizome, which is the other way people purchase hop plants, which would be more like a bare root. And so we highly recommend those rooted cuttings. And then the Gorse Valley place, they have a really good virus program, and so you're more likely to get a clean, virus-free, disease-free plant, which uh, you really obviously want. That's why even if you're just in your backyard, you don't want to make the investment of time and energy and then have them all die. So rooted cuttings, and they can be, depending on how much you're buying and the variety and this and that, um, anywhere from, I don't know what we're paying, somewhere around 250 a plant all the way up to 750 Okay. Uh, and then do they follow the, the rule of traditional perennials? Because gardeners always hear the term sleep, creep, leap. You know, the first year they're they're kind of getting established, and the second year they grow even more, and then the third year they, they're crazy. Um, do you notice that with hops? Do they just get bigger and bigger and bigger and more lush each yeah, year? Yeah, absolutely. Um, they, get, they have the same three-year phrase. The first year is their baby year. Uh, second year is their teenage year, and third year they're fully mature. So they, um, the, the first year, you don't harvest them. You want to leave as much of that plant matter with the plant so that it can finesse it back in the fall and have a stronger spring. Okay. And then the second year you can harvest, but you only expect about 50% of the total uh, expected yield when it's mature. And then third year and beyond, you're looking at mature yields. And unlike things like strawberries or fruit trees um, that get tired over time, uh, we don't expect to fall off of yield from hot plants over time. Okay. They are uh, very vigorous, and because they don't have as much year-to-year living matter, especially as like a tree, I think that helps extend their, their livelihood. So. Huh. And then how about pruning? How do you do it, When and what's the impact of it? That's a really hard question to answer. So you definitely do want to prune your plants in the spring, 
because those first shoots are more likely to be carrying disease. And so if you can remove them and then they'll die off, uh, you can reduce the chance of disease getting onto the, the parts of the plant that you grow throughout the season. But it's tricky, too, because in a production setting, when and if you prune is one of the primary determinants of your, of your yield, it turns out. So we don't know when to tell people to prune in Minnesota, but in a backyard setting, it is very smart to prune them early on in the season when they're probably about six inches long. Okay. And then once they regrow from that up to about a foot and a half long is when you would start training them, which means going out there, picking up your four favorite, four or five favorite vines from each plant and spinning them clockwise up uh, your whatever trellising material you're using. And do you have to secure them in some way, or you can just spin them and they stay? Yeah, spin them and they'll go up. Yep. Huh. They have um, they have uh, little little uh, spikies on them. Yeah, they that are do. really fine, mm-hmm. and they use that to, to hold on. They hold on really well. Yeah. Some people will react to those spikies, so they not only do they have little spikies that'll scratch you, um, but there's there's some oils on the plant that some people have a topical reaction to. Yeah, I was so reading that. So you'll get a cut and a kind of a red rash. Yes. Do you, have you ever had any people that are coming to help pick, and then they're like, oh, I can't do this. We I'm have, yeah. So we actually have Benadryl around oh, ben- uh, for all the picking. <laughs> so that if people, wow. if people react. No, even the, the strongest reaction I've ever seen has just been, you know, like uh, a lot of red skin that itched a little bit. But it's really interesting. Once well, you get, once, like Ben and I, we don't really react anymore because I think we're used to it. I was reading you can get actually one of those little hairs or whatever those little fibers are on the stem. You can get it in your eyes. So you got to be careful. Oh, that'd be bad. Yeah, Yeah, that would be bad. So um, talk to me about the different varieties you grow. And let's Mm -hmm. talk while we're doing that. Let's incorporate how they smell because you're growing aromatic hops and there's there's a scent and you can you can tell the difference, right? Mm -hmm. Well, to an extent, I don't think I've been working with hops long enough to be that good Um, because there's a broad brush stroke. There's there's three or four wide kind of pools that hops, that aroma hops fit into. And there's there's European style aroma hops or European style hops that lend kind of grassy or earthy tones to the beer. Uh, American style hops are, are defined by either really heavy citrus notes or heavy floral or pine. And so pine is more on the cascade kind of citrusy and piney and then over on like towards centennial is a lot more citrus and crystal it's a lot more citrus than pine um then there's some spice too in some of our varieties here and uh out over in in australia and new zealand they're breeding all sorts of wild varieties down there that have flavors like um well, one from japan that tastes like lemongrass or dill and stuff from uh new zealand can be really stone fruit heavy um, it's, it's kind of wild. There's hops all over the board. And then, of course, where they're grown matters, too. Yeah. So not only do we have those three distinctive styles of hop from these different regions of the world, if you were to grow a Cascade hop out west versus a Cascade hop grown here in Minnesota, there, there will be uh, slight uh, terroir differences um, and things that a trained uh, hop farmer or brewer would likely be able to pick up. And that especially is something that we're looking to narrow in on as we dial in our production practices and more consistent uh, quality results, really doing some, uh, a battery of quality analysis and sensory analysis and start to figure out, well, what is, or what are those defining characteristics of, of, you know, Minnesota grown varieties of hops? It's very much like wine and growing grapes in that sense, because you can grow the same grapes. Yep. in different parts of the country and end up with all different kinds of flavors. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's very, very interesting. I love how uh, I love how your palate and your discernment is a skill that's going to grow as you um, continue to grow your your um, hops. So that's very interesting as well. I can't wait. Yeah, I like. I uh, you know we drink a lot of beer, you know, <laughs> for for science and for learning, and uh, it's fun to to deepen deepen my knowledge of it. Yeah. Now, your logo is really clever, and I, I noticed there's a subtle mustache at the top of the hops. That's that's your logo. How did you come up with that? The logo, actually, our our, our buddy in, in college, he, this was his first design. His wow. first design client was us. Uh, so he made that, that full kind of the axe and hop cone 
logo for us. Uh, we love it. We still use it. Uh, we're working with him again. His name is Justin. He's an excellent, excellent guy and a great designer. We're working with him again to update the brand here, too. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I really like that design because it's a, there's so many different aspects to it. So we designed it simply to have the axe handle in the middle, the axe head and the handle. Oh, I completely like missed inside that. the hop cone. Okay. That's that's what it's supposed to look like, quote unquote. That's like the hidden image. But then people have found things. Obviously, it looks kind of like a beard. There's the mustache that you pointed out towards the top, and then there's actually a bunch of M's and A's. If you trace the the blank space between the the leaves, if you will. Oh my god! You can court. You can you can create a handful of M's and A's too. So Mighty X uh, is in there. So it's kind of cool. Well, now I have. I ended up having a lot of different regard. aspects to it. <laughs> yeah, now I have even more regard for it. That's amazing. And then you have to tell me you have this new red logo, very striking. And oh yeah, I, that I, was for the the big announcement. Yeah, I call it Hop the Hops Revolution logo. What what is that? What's the significance of that to you? Yeah, so for the for this this big announcement for the announcement of this expansion, we were we really wanted to do something special to celebrate and, and really highlight the importance of, of what we're up to. So we worked with a local studio called Angel Bomb to come up with a, a revolutionary propaganda-style uh, poster and design for that announcement. And um, we really like what ended up coming out of it. There's um, some beautiful imagery in there. The, the reds and the yellows are really pretty, and uh, Angel Bomb did a great job on that. I we'll uh, we'll probably be be rolling be rolling that design back around here um, for the kind of groundbreaking ribbon cutting ribbon cutting out out here at the new site next year too. So folks who folks who really want a t shirt with that logo on it, you might just be in luck. Oh, that's so good because I was going to order one and then I'm like, oh my gosh, they sold out. It's just like your hops. You can't keep these things in stock. <laughs> Yeah, it's a, it's a good problem to have, I guess. Yeah, it's a great problem to have. Let's talk about picking hops, because mm-hmm. um, I was reading, you you mentioned numerous times that you're testing for moisture content. So yeah. what what are you doing, and, and how how do you test? It's kind of like bricks. Um, when, you're, when you're testing the bricks on, on strawberries or grapes, um, but you're looking for the, the, the right amount of moisture left in the flower to know when, when your hop is perfectly ripe. Hmm. And so you test those by taking representative samples throughout your yard. Yep. And in the grower's guide that we have on our website, we detail the really cheap, easy at-home method that you just need a microwave, microwave-safe plastic, and a gram scale. To, and you, you could go through your, your hops and harvest them exactly the right, the right time or their peak ripeness. And that's really important for harvest because... You time that right, and that's as good as the hop is ever going to be. You know, as soon as you remove it from the from the from its from its vine, it starts to degrade. Mm. And so you want to start your hops at the tallest tallest peak of of quality, and then process them as best and as quickly as you can to save as much of that as that beautiful beautiful quality as you can. Wow! So there's a little bit of pressure there when you're harvesting. Yeah, harvest season gets pretty crazy. Wow! And then they're gone. And you're left with nothing but the poles. Yep. Is yep. That, and you have a big, you have a, just a lot of poles in the ground. Is that, a low, crazy. is that a low energy time for you? Do you get kind of sad when they're all gone? No, it's, that's a relief time because you've <laughs> made it through harvest and, and you can go back to, you can go and do some winter things. Yes. You know, sit down for a little while. And recharge a little bit. Uh, the plants, are you, you, you cut them down to the ground or how low do you go when you're harvesting? You're going to want to leave as, as, as much of a plant as you can. Um, we'll, be, we'll be leaving at least a foot and a half on all of ours. But okay. uh, as, as they mature, you can, you can leave a little bit more. Because that's just, that's just extra bonus um, energy that the plant can save hmm. uh, when, when it enters towards the dormancy phase. So we like to leave as much as we can. Okay. And then to be or not to be organic. Early articles hmm. reported that you you know you were keeping your operation small and you can manage your crops without having to spray pesticides and then um you're getting bigger. I mean, you're getting a lot bigger. So, what is your goal for Mighty Axe? Are you going to pursue the organic thing or do you think it's unrealistic? I think it's I think that it's unrealistic for where the market and where our skills are at right now. Um 
organic hops is something that works for a bunch of people and, and is uh, incredibly difficult. And for us, we're looking to become really good hop growers and then start to add the additional challenges of being an organic hop grower. And while we, we're not organic yet, um, we're going to look to start transitioning the smaller plot in Ham Lake and use that as a test to see how organic practices would work. And um, it's something that, that's, that's incredibly difficult to do with hops. But on the same hand, um, on, the, on the other hand, if we're, we're not organic, but we're certainly not as um, aggressive as you could be yes. <laughs> with your growing practices. We're still uh, limiting to the extent possible any sort of pesticide or insecticide use, relying heavily on, on integrated pest management and kind of managing an ecosystem, a balanced ecosystem of predator and prey to keep our hops healthy. Um, fungicide is the main thing that you have a really hard time in an organic system providing. Uh, with hops, your big, big problem is, um, is downy mildew, okay. it's a fungus, um, and it's very difficult to control organically. You have limited options. So you're still spraying. If you're organic, you're still spraying fungicide. You're just spraying more kind of broad-spectrum copper mist stuff. Hmm. And, and that's, that's, a whole, that's a whole segment. But it's something that, that, that is where our values lie, yes. uh, and we're going to move that direction and be as good stewards as we can. Well, and you're millennials, and you are falling right in, lo- right in line with what millennials value. And, of course, it would be something you would do if you could, right? Absolutely. Now, can you talk about hops in Minnesota without talking about Charlie Rohr? <laughs> Dr. Hops, Charlie? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, his his interim leadership and his uh, ability to reach out and talk to more people about Minnesota hops, he was there uh, about, you know, he got started about the same time as Hippity Hops, um, but was, did a better job of, of telling the story to a wider audience. He really brought it. To another level, and Charlie, Charlie, and Angela Orshinsky and Josh Havel, who are two other researchers at the U working on hops, are is critical to the success of our industry here. You know, a mature industry, you know, involves um, involves research and development, which which the University of Minnesota and, and Charlie is leading, and it involves uh, you know strong technical support and. Uh, like network of producers, and that's what the Minnesota Hop Growers Association does. And what we've been lacking so far is the like strong, like producer example, like the farm actually doing it um, and doing it for a living. Um, and that's what we're hoping to be. And he also is very passionate about trying to breed a variety of hops that likes growing in Minnesota. Right? He's always testing oh, yeah. and propagating that way. Yeah, that's. I mean. When, we are. We wish them all the best because that's an incredibly lengthy and risky and uh, resource-intensive process to develop a new hop variety, and uh, we're really hoping that they come out with something that grows well and that brewers like, and uh, that'd be really good for hop growers in the state to have something like that. Well, uh, you touched on this just briefly, but there was a little article in Growler Magazine about the history of hops farming in Minnesota, which, I mean, really, we're right in the beginning of. And it's dated uh, February 22nd, 2014, so just after Valentine's Day a couple years ago. And it said, that is a date to remember because more than 60 people got together at Dayblock Brewing Company in Minneapolis. And there were 20 folks that couldn't get there because we'd had just a hellacious winter storm earlier. Uh, in that week and and people couldn't get there and it was a reminder of how complicated and how challenging our issues are growing hops in Minnesota but that group got together and that was the very first meeting of the Minnesota Hop Growers Association they have a Facebook page as well and this was something that you wanted to see happen you were one of the most vocal advocates for getting this type of organization together together Absolutely. Ben, ben is our, my, my best friend, Ben is our liaison, if you will, to the MHGA. He's on the board. And um, that's a critical, like I said before, that's a critical aspect of supporting a, a healthy industry of local hops here in Minnesota is that producer network. And they're doing a very good job of that. And they have hundreds of members and membership is really 
uh, relatively cheap. I think it's still only 40 bucks a year, mm. and you just get access to so much, such a wealth of information and support from the grower network. People always ask me, like, well, what should I do first when I want to grow hops? So it's like, well, don't plant any hops. Join the Hop Growers Association and go to some meetings, go to some classes, ask a lot of questions, and then decide if you want to make the investment. Great advice. Well, and and that's a great segue into this next question. And it's something I wanted to get your reaction to, because to me, spending time in the garden, connecting with the land is such a counterpoint to our modern society. And being Mm -hmm. able to slow down and really focus on and attend to what's happening on the land with the right expectations around the amount of time it's going to take and the amount of commitment it's going to take, that's something people can often underestimate. So what would you tell someone as far as um, what it's like to have to unplug and focus on the day-to-day needs of running a farm or a, or even a, a smaller plot in a, you know, a suburb? I mean, it's a lot more work than you probably think it is if you're not used to it. Um, As any gardener knows, when you first got started, you were probably uh, a little surprised. Uh, but it's a lot more rewarding than anyone ever expects. Um, for me, there's, there is this really, really deep, um, connection to working with soil. Uh, I think that's something that is, uh, relatively universal human experience way back. The majority of our ancestors were agriculturalists and there's there's a long history of that in, in, in human evolution. I think that we grew together with the plants and with the soil and with working hard outside. And I think that it's something that a lot of people can find very, very rewarding, whatever your scale is. I mean, doing it for a living is a, or trying to do it for a living is a really, really uh, high bar and uh, farmers do not have it easy, but uh, even trying to grow a successful garden, I mean, you can, you can have that experience there too. Well, and you're passionate about getting folks back into farming, and you had posted on your Facebook page that the average age of a farmer is 57, that the average age of an organic farmer is 34, and you're not even 30 yet. You believe that local hops can be grown sustainably and have a good financial return on small acreages and can benefit small family farms. How do you uh, talk to other young people or what would you say to, you know, people in their 20s who are probably not even considering farming as an option, right? You go to college and you're, you're not thinking farming. Yeah. Most people, especially if you, you don't, you're not a, um, you know, someone coming off of a farm, you know, if you're one or two generations removed from the farm, I don't even think that's an option people consider anymore, is it? Yeah, unfortunately, no. I think that there is, there was, well, especially, well, especially with, with my parents' generation, there was generally you always left the farm. Although there was a little bit of a uh, return to the farm movement growing amongst the millennial generation. It's just a great place where you can live out your values really physically. You can tell a lot about what a farmer thinks about the world and how they perceive their place in it by how they farm and what their farm looks like and what's on their farm and what's not on their farm. Uh, how they manage their farm. That's a it's um, a very very visceral way to be in touch with your values, um, which I think draws a lot of people to it. I th- I mean I would just say that if you're thinking about farming, do it. And there are so many resources and groups out there that can help mentor you, that can give you the apprenticeships or the internships, so you can get a little taste. Because working on a farm as a field hand is a great way to learn a, a handful about farming. But until you're actually operating your own farm, you, you really can't have a sense of how much work it is and how much how many different hats you have to wear. I mean, you have to be a horticulturalist, you have to be a, a, a an accountant, you have to be a business person, you have to be a politician, you have to be a leader. Increasingly, you have to be good at messaging and telling your story. Um, it really is being an entrepreneur. Um, and that creates that takes a lot of passion, a lot of drive to be successful at it. And I... Uh, I try to support all the it's it's really it's it's something that that as a country we face the, the challenge of replacing the generations of farmers that we're losing. I think more so than age the thing that scares me most is that you know we lose about 100,000 farmers. Uh we lost about 100,000 farmers in the last egg census and we had only gained um somewhere around 5,000. 
uh, under the age of 35, mm-hmm. which is just a, a tremendous, <laughs> that's a tremendous uh, dichotomy. You don't, you don't ever replace 100,000, uh, five or even 10,000 at a time. So we really need to have a conversation as a country and figure out what are the best ways and what are the multiple tools we can use to address that gap. Well, and that it doesn't have to just be a male profession. Oh, and for starters, mm-hmm. doesn't have to be male, doesn't have to be white. You don't have to have grown up in it. And I think those are some of the questions that the current folks who are active players in agriculture need to be seriously considering for their organizations, right? Oh, you also don't have to be old, right? Yeah. So the old white male from a rural setting cannot be the only person who farms in our country or is allowed to farm or is welcome to farm in our country. Uh, they're going extinct. They're going away. Yep. The country is changing, and agriculture needs to change with it. Well said. Well, lots of great insight into that problem. That's a huge challenge moving forward. Now, uh, you are so blessed and lucky because you started farming on land that's been in your family for four generations. Your dad left the farm. Uh, He made a career in business. So when you were returning to the land, um, you got to go back to land that your great-grandfather broke more than a century ago. And I just, as a genealogist, I love seeing the pictures of you and your grandpa, Grandpa Al, um, and sometimes (laughs) grandma's in there too, Grandma Betty, right? Oh, yeah. Yep. And uh, there's a great picture of uh, him supervising the uh, test plot back in May 2013 when you were doing this (laughs) trellis install. Um, And you shared a picture of them on the days that the poles arrived at the farm. They're both standing there, I think, looking at these huge wondering, poles. Wondering what they've, what they've agreed to. And yeah. they're saying, what is our favorite grandson, Eric, doing now, right? <laughs> All <laughs> yeah. your cousins are like, oh, Eric, right? No, I'm teasing. It's only, it's only, uh, it's only gotten worse every year as more poles have gone up. <laughs> I'm sure. But, um, and, then, and then there was a really sweet one, too, that was recent, and you're signing some type of water conservancy thing with your new project, which I don't want to get into yet. But I love that you're involving them, and, you know, I think you're going to treasure that. As time goes on, yeah. you'll, you'll never regret the fact that you kind of folded them into experiencing this amazing journey you've started your whole family on. I think it's tremendous. I mean, we couldn't have we couldn't have started. I couldn't have started farming if it wasn't for you know their support and the family land being there, and um, you know a lot of a lot of privilege has gone into my ability to be where I am today. I'm very aware of that, and I'm really appreciative that they have such big uh, welcoming uh, hearts to let someone who has no idea what they're doing start to mess around on their land. Uh, that's grandma's grandma grandma's family farmland, and to. Uh, mm. To share that with me, the land that her her dad, my great grandfather, uh, earned their living from, is uh, an incredible gift. Wow. Well, this is all. This whole interview is really leading up to this whole revolution thing that you've started. It's been in all of the papers. Um, it's actually what caught my attention and made me want to interview you because I saw it in the Star Tribune, which is the big one of the big papers in uh, in town here in Minneapolis. But you just announced this June this four point six million dollar project, which includes a one point three million dollar harvest facility and one hundred and twenty acres of farmland in Benton County. Uh, is it Gilmanton Township? Yeah. Yep. And uh, the family land, the land you started on is going to become your test field. And this means that Mighty Axe will be the state's largest hop farm by far. And yeah. it's always good to be an early adapter. And you're right in there. You're right in the, the scene, the hop scene in Minnesota, right at the beginning. What are your thoughts as you begin this new part of the Mighty Axe story? The luck is certainly still a pretty overwhelming feeling, um, but that's transitioning now. And through the feeling of, oh, crap, what have we gotten ourselves into? <laughs> and to just uh, really, I feel like I'm growing a lot into this role, that the place where my sometimes windy path over the last five or six years of my life uh, has been leading to, like I'm arriving I'm in a I'm in a state of arrival over the next year or so. Feels really right. Um, I try to remind myself every day, even on 
on days and weeks like this where I'm tamping poles in the ground for eight to nine hours a day and then have, still have to go do the office work that, you know, this is exactly what I want to be doing. And if I, can, if I complain about this or get lazy about this, then there's really nothing that I could ever do to be happy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so uh, it's just an incredible sense of, of accomplishment and um, uh, arrival. That's where I'm at. I'm, I'm, I'm starting to to get to where I've always wanted to be. Well, it's amazing. And, and, you know, it wasn't that long ago, I was reading an an interview that you'd given and you said, as an industry, we're kind of unorganized. We need a decision maker. We need leaders to set the tone to make sure we're acting and working Mm -hmm. uh, professionally. But then you also were talking about um, being able to be a consistent and quality supplier. This really makes that happen for you, doesn't it? Right. I mean, this is the what we were talking about earlier, I mean, this is the level investment of investment that it takes to produce hops at a quantity consistently and then quality wise. I mean, that, that harvest facility uh, is housing. That's just the cost of the building. And then inside the building is all the expensive equipment, the specialty picker, the specialty dryer, specialty pelleter and the freezer to produce to take your crop from the field and turn it into what the brewer demands, uh, how the brewer demands it. And um, it really is kind of a, it's a big chop to take. Yeah, it is. I, w- I have a few little kind of ancillary questions, and they all go along yeah. with this whole new venture you're starting. Um, one is uh, your cover cropping. Mm-hmm. Cover cropping is, from my point of view, one of the, the lowest hanging fruit. If you're serious about managing your land well, protecting water quality, investing in soil health, new enormous benefits just directly to you and your property, even if you're not thinking about what happens downstream. Um, I mean, I mean, literally downstream. So cover cropping is something that, that, that is critical to us for managing our soil health and, and controlling our water flows. Uh, it's something that as we grow and we, will, we incorporate that into our actual production fields, So you'll see in Ham Lake, there's clover, a perennial clover planted amongst our hops. Um, Out here at the larger scale uh, in Foley or Gilmington Township, uh, we'll be having uh, semi-annual cover. So it'll be coming, we'll be planting in July. We'll leave it over through the the wet and runoff season of the spring. So that'll help maintain and keep water and soil on my property. Um, And then we'll incorporate it in the spring again after after runoff season is over because that's where we really get the most soil benefit is by incorporating that living green manure people will call it mm-hmm. into the ground it gives it gives habitat and food for the microbes that is so critical to soil health so there's a wonderful wonderful cycle to it and um it's also beautiful i'm sitting here talking to you in the middle middle of 30 acres of of oat that is about a foot tall at this point and uh, it's gorgeous to look at, and I'll keep growing. So hmm. it's it's got a whole lot of benefits to it. Cover cropping is just the the absolute minimum, hmm. I think that 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 farmers should be doing. And what are buffer strips? It says what that's one of the things you're yeah, committing to as well. Strips. Yeah, it's it's buffer strips are a touchy political subject uh, in farm farmland and in farm policy. Um, the current governor of Minnesota, Mark Dayton, uh, pushed strongly for uh, buffer strips. Uh, buffer strip enforcement here in Minnesota. What buffer strips are, it's a word for uh, an untilled or otherwise managed 30 to 50 feet on either side of any drainage ditch or stream or river that helps to to slow down the pace of water coming off the field and filter out nutrients, filter out uh, sediment, and, and make sure that the water is not just hitting the public waterways in a cleaner state, but also in a slower way. When you just have water rushing off a field, it takes so much with it, and it creates so much damage to the waterbed and the streambed that it's landing in. Buffers can go a really long way to uh, protecting water quality. And so we'll, we'll be having buffer strips, too. Um, buffer strips and cover, cover crops and a couple of the other things that we're able to do in our production are, are why we're egg water quality certified. Okay. This is a voluntary program that the Minnesota Department of Agriculture has, has put together. It's one of the first like it in the country. It's incredible. They just passed having 100,000 acres enrolled. And what each one of those acres has promised to do, the farmer, 
uh, has signed a contract, um, voluntarily signed a contract with the government that says, I am going to keep growing using these practices or better. And in return, farmers who are egg water quality certified get protection from future potential regulation. So if we're meeting or exceeding current water protection standards from the point of view of the Department of Agriculture, the farmer in return uh, gets 10 years of what they call regulatory certainty, which means for 10 years they can change whatever rules they want uh, related to water quality, and I can have some protection from that affecting my my operation, which is uh, a really smart thing for a farmer to do because if anyone's rationally looking at the situation right now, uh, egg and farmers really need to be taking more active responsibility for the effect that we have on our water and our landscapes. Yes. And someday, someday the uh, elected, the elected, uh, the elected and the regulatory bodies are just going to say, you know what? To heck with voluntary programs. We're going to have mandatory programs with enforcement. And if you haven't changed by then, you're going to have a harder time changing then than than going ahead of time and being proactive about it. Well, and along so it's a, those it's an lines, incredible program. well, absolutely. And along those lines, um, I read that you will be planting uh, things that will benefit pollinators, and that the yep. main building on this facility is going to have uh, solar pan solar panels on the. Well, the solar panels is the goal. That's a that's a couple years out before okay. we can officially commit to doing that but that's like a huge goal of mine it's something that the building's ready for and it's just a matter of getting through like because that's kind of like an accoutrement at this point right like we need to grow hops and sell hops and then we can be like okay well let's put some solar panels on the roof now that we got everything else under control but yeah as far as what's going in our buffer strip and the design of how we move water around the property all of that will be taken with an eye towards towards native and wild plantings um I'm very, very excited about the kind of conservation and stewardship opportunities on this larger piece of land. I mean, the family farm is like 20 acres total, and it's about three acres of tillable land where we have hops. And here we're, we're sitting at 120, and it's amazing opportunities to, to have be a positive force on the landscape. I think it's fantastic. Now, you are also um, going to be composting, and I was reading... Uh, these vine, these vines are are twenty feet tall, but you're only yeah. harvesting the cones. So you've got all the leaves, you've got the oh. vines, and they're full of uh, energy and nutrients. And you can use those as part of your composting effort. How how do you plan on using them? We're actually still developing our composting plan right now because it's really critical that the compost is reaching the temperatures that it needs to be to break down and kill. Uh, bacteria or viruses that might grow on the decaying plant matter. So for us, uh, that's a, a kind of safety of, of controlling viruses is really important for our composting program. But that'll be done on site. We'll be taking off everything but the cone that comes out the end of the picking machine and managing that to turn it back into, uh, you know, something close to soil. That makes a lot of business sense, makes a lot of farm sense because, you know, we spent water and nutrients and time growing all of that. And if we're just going to throw it out or burn it, that's a bit of a waste. Um, Then, of course, environmentally, it's a big waste, and it's just composting that stuff is what makes sense. Put it back on the field. That's right. Well, if I'm a brewer, how do I buy your hops? Well, you guys can, uh, brewers can just contact us through any, I mean, Facebook, email, Twitter, phone number, whatever they want. My email is just eric at mightyaxhops.com. And if people have questions about hops, they can shoot them to me, too. But, uh, yeah, through our website, there's all sorts of contact contact information on there. And uh, we'll send along a little welcome packet that tells you more about what we're up to, and we can go from there. I love it. Highly no, encourage people visit the farm, too. Well, I was just going to say, welcome. yeah, you have this tour that's coming up August 7th. Yes. You just did one, and now you've got another one coming up August 7th. Tell us a little bit about the tour. What do you do? What can people expect? I'm bringing my kids. We're going. I'm, I'm dragging all four of them. Awesome. I know my folks even awesome. said they wanted to come. So you're going to get Grandma and Grandpa and all the little Ebling kids. We're coming up. Can't wait. Can't wait. August 7th is our, is our last public tour of the year. Um, and that is going to be uh, uh, a wonderful time of season to be in the hop yard. The cones should start to be forming. The flowers that we actually harvest will start to be showing up by then. And uh, you'll, uh, what someone going on the tour can expect is a couple of hours of Ben and Eric's time to answer your questions, to talk to you about the growing process of hops, to look at kind of our first, the quarter acre, 
demonstration plot, look at some of the more production style plots of hops, see some of the equipment that we use, and uh, generally spend time in 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 a really beautiful place that time of year. Well, and this is the f- the special place too. This is the family farm, right, where the tour is at. Yep, yep, for this year. Okay, and then next year, do you have an eye on a time or a date for your groundbreaking? Yeah, next year's so the next kind of events we have coming up is we'll we'll have a picking party. We do a picking party every year, and that'll be at Ham Lake this year. Mm. Um, and then next year we'll start doing more regular tours here at the at the Foley site. Okay. And uh, we'll do a ribbon cutting, a big ribbon cutting party sometime next uh, next season as well. I can't say when. Sometime July or August. All right. And then you said you would participate in a listener giveaway, too. So for people who yeah. are passionate about getting their hands on some of this very hard to find merchandise, you're going to give away a T-shirt and maybe a few <laughs> yeah, other things. Well, well uh, the, the lucky winner will uh, we'll work with them to get a T-shirt of their size, uh, the gray Mighty Axe Hops. Kind of the original with the local house or local beer tagline on the back and a couple of stickers, maybe even a bottle opener. And we'll see what ends up in that box. Ooh, that sounds fun. Awesome. Well, Eric, I want to thank you for your time today. I know you were working as we were talking. And uh, I just I have to commend you for what you're doing. I think you're a fearless leader and an awesome entrepreneur. uh, And I think you're leaving a legacy that someday your great, great grandchildren will look back on and be so proud of. Thanks. You know, thanks so much for having me. Um, I can, I'd be very lucky if my great grandchildren look up to me. So we'll just see, huh? Oh, I'm certain they will. And I'm sure that they will also have lots of stories about great grandpa Eric. Well, thanks again, Eric. This was absolutely fantastic. And I so appreciate you being very generous with your time today. Well, thank you for your time. And we'll see you in August. All right. That sounds great. Thanks, Eric. Yeah, bye bye. All right. Bye bye. Well, that's it for our show today. I want to thank Eric Sanrud of Mighty Axe Hops for giving us such a fantastic interview while at the same time working so incredibly hard on his hops farm. Talk about multitasking. I don't know about you guys, but I'm ready for a nice cold beer. As always, you can find this podcast on iTunes as well as Stitcher Radio, my very favorite app for listening to podcasts. And you can subscribe directly to my blog to get the posts via email. I'll have all the information from this show today on my blog at sixfootmama.com. That's the number six, F-T-M-A-M-A.com. And that's the home of Still Growing. And you can find this episode in the top menu under the Still Growing podcast. You can always find me at sixfootmama.com or on facebook.com backslash still growing with sixfootmama or email me directly at jennifer at sixfootmama.com. Still Growing with Jennifer Eveling is a sixfootmama.com production made in lovely Maple Grove, Minnesota. Still Growing is an hour long weekly gardening podcast dedicated to helping you and your garden grow. <laughs>